Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Change Garden. We're delighted that you've chosen to spend this sunny Saturday morning joining us at Fair Trade UK, and we have an incredible lineup for you today. So I'm Rachel Chamassi Corson. I'm co-founder of Afrocentrics, an ethical hair care range that made safe, effective products for Afro and curly hair. And I'm joined by a phenomenal panel today. So I'll introduce them in a moment, but first I want to remind everyone that you can submit questions, just type them into the chat and we'll come to the Q&A at the end of our panel. So this event will be comprised in two halves. The first half will be an incredible workshop, which will show you how you can fight climate change from your garden. And the second half will be a panel with our incredible speakers who I'll introduce now. So we have DS Pritham and Titus Gerald Pinto, who are tea growers joining us live from India. We have eco-chef Tom Hunt, who has just released an incredible book, and we'll actually be giving away some copies of this book, so stay tuned until later on when we tell you more about that. And we have Chris Warburton-Brown from Permaculture Association, who will be telling you some more about the work that he's been doing. So before we go on, I'll just let everyone give a little wave. We'll do proper intros later on. <laughs> okay, so this year with Fair Trade Fortnite, our focus has been on choosing the world you want. So it's all about fair trade, it's all about climate change action, and it's all about what you can do to make a real difference. So fair trade is super important for us every single day. The Many of us had tea this morning as part of our breakfast, or we ate bananas, or we had something that was grown, uh, often in the global south, and many of these products are fair trade it's become easier than ever to actually take part in fair trade. I'm currently wearing a fair trade dress. Even my jewelry is fairly mined silver. So it's more and more becoming easy for us to personally take part, but it's hard to know what to do about such a huge problem as climate change. And this year, the last year has been a year like no other. COVID has had a huge negative impact on the entire world. And particularly for those regions where there's economic inequality, uh, the regions where many of our growers live across the continents of Africa and Asia, they've been hit incredibly hard. So fair trade makes a bigger difference now than ever. And as we deal with the climate crisis, and we think about the fact that many of our <laughs> beloved plants uh, are under threat, when we think of the impact of the climate crisis on cocoa growth, on coffee growth, it's definitely time for all of us to take notice, because even if we ignore the climate crisis, it will have an impact on our lives. So I'm very excited to introduce Chris, and we're going to have a short film from Chris before we actually hear from the man himself. This is incredibly important stuff because we can all make a difference through things like our house plants. As you can see, I'm obsessed with house plants, and more importantly, the way that we choose to garden can make a difference when it comes to climate change. So I will hand over to Chris, and before we hear from the man himself. We'll just watch a short video. It's a very beautiful early summer's day here in the east end of Newcastle and I'd like to welcome you to my home and my garden. Um, come in. So we live in a very typical 1920s council house, ex-council house. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have the park right opposite with some beautiful mature trees which give you pleasure every single day of the year. Huge big sky which we can look at, um, which is lovely and watch the weather changing. Uh, but we've also made some contributions of our own here to the biodiversity. We're very lucky to share the biodiversity with the park. Um, you can see here are my wife's beautiful flowers that she's planted. Uh, this artichoke which we originally planted to eat but actually we just tend to leave it now for ornamental purposes. Uh, pear tree which was new, we just put that in a couple of years ago and last year we had some lovely pears on it for the first time. Here we have a Christmas tree that we uh, we bought as a living tree and then planted out which you can see here and has done very well and every Christmas we decorate this uh, outside. Um, it's a very small space but actually we packed a lot in and the honeysuckle growing up the front of the house and we're encouraging it to spread out uh, there. When we first came to this house 20 years ago there wasn't a single plant in this garden except grass everything you can see here are things that we planted ourselves close to the house which gets shadowed by the house in winter so it doesn't get too much 
uh, lied, we put uh, the lawn and then some trees, we've got apple, pear, bay tree, rosemary, um, raspberry bushes, another apple tree, then we come to the middle of the garden which contains the raised beds, currently containing potatoes, herbs and a mixture of flowers. I've moved away from annual production to far more perennials now. Then at the top garden we've got the bins hidden there, we've got a cherry tree, uh, an apple tree, another plum and some blackberry bushes. So I hope this gives you some ideas and inspiration for your own garden. Uh, it shows you what you can do in a small suburban garden. You don't need a lot of space to do fun and creative things. Um, thank you for coming and if you'd like to step this way. Enjoy the rest of your day. Right, thank you. Uh, so that's a very quick three minute tour of my, uh, my own garden. Uh, I hope straight away it gives you some inspiration for what you might be able to do um, yourselves. Um, I, for the last three years, I've been working on a project called 52 Climate Actions. I got my plug in. I think we're all plugging something today. Tom's going to plug his book. So I'll get my uh, quick plug in uh, for our 52 Climate Actions website. If I'd been clever and marketing savvy, I would have. Um, of course, uh, shown off the actual website itself. But um, 52climateactions.com, you can find it. One of the actions on there is use climate tolerant plants, which is directly relevant today. And also there's plant a forest garden on there. Um, am, I, am I all right here? I just give me, okay, my picture is frozen. Yeah. I'm good, okay, thanks, great. Um, so in developing this uh, 52climateactions.com, uh, we um, decided we'd work through and we developed this idea of there really being three pillars of climate action. And they're the three things I'm gonna talk about today. The one that you'll all be familiar with is mitigation, also known as footprint uh, reduction. So we're all familiar with that. Change your light bulbs, insulate your house, fly less. Uh, lower the uh, carbon footprint of your lifestyle. That, if you look at most websites about climate change and climate change advice and climate action, it'll mostly talk about uh, mitigation. But as we went along, particularly our Australian colleagues became increasingly concerned about adaptation because they were starting to face droughts, forest fires, uh, and so on, on quite a big scale. And so they were pushing very hard as we developed the project to look at adaptation. That is to say how we change our own lifestyle to cope with uh, the impact of climate change on us. Um, so that also is increasingly important. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that as the second pillar. And then the third pillar, which really emerged towards the end of our project, was thinking differently. And increasingly, I actually think this is the most important of the three. Um, fair trade is a good example of thinking differently. We need new paradigms, new ways of thinking. Uh, which move us beyond the kind of um, neoliberal capitalist model that we've been living in, which I, in itself can't really uh, solve climate change. We need to develop new ways of thinking, new ways of eating, ways of living. So they're my, my three pillars, uh, and I encourage everybody to engage with all three of those pillars. Mitigation, reduce your carbon footprint. Adaptation, get ready for how climate change is going to affect you. Think differently. Um, start to tear up the old assumptions that you've had and be prepared to think creatively about new foods, uh, new lifestyle, uh, almost in every aspect of, of climate change are things we can do to think differently. Uh, walk instead of drive, uh, trade instead of fly, uh, eat less meat, uh, buy fair trade, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So when it comes to the, uh, the, 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 the garden, um, the I, I each, I'm going to take each of those, it's a rule of three today, I'm going to take each of those three pillars and suggest three things that you can do under each of those. So it's kind of not a nine point plan 
for a climate change garden that I'm going to uh, talk about today. Um, so the first thing uh, to, to think about, I'm going to start with adaptation um, in, in this list. And the first thing to think about, the first of my nine things to do is to get ready for climate weirding. Uh, you can also call it climate chaos. I personally really like climate weirding because that is what's happening. So if I just give a very recent example, um, in the middle week of February, it was minus three degrees here. There was snow on the ground and all the sort of standing water everywhere was frozen. That was on the Sunday. The following Sunday, it was 17 degrees here. So that was a leap of 20 degrees centigrade in a week. I mean, that is climate, that is climate weirding. Uh, absolutely in action. You know, we went from the middle of winter to what felt like a warm spring day in, in seven days. Um, and we see that over and over again. And there are, uh, I think, three key points to, to, to climate. Everything's about three today. Three key things with climate weirding. One's going to be about rainfall. Um, we're already seeing this is all over the world, not just in the UK. We're going to get long periods of drought and we're going to get periods of kind of monsoon style, absolutely trucking it down, floods uh, and so on. So the, in terms of thinking about what you do in your garden, I think the first thing to think about is water supply. Uh, is your garden proof or increasingly proof? I mean, you can't 100% proof it, but is it increasingly proofed against heavy torrential rainfall uh, events? And is it proofed against long periods of drought? Uh, and I'm not going to go... Uh, the, the second point to make is a, a shift from annual crops to perennials. Um, if you look outside your window, you won't see many uh, annual crops growing uh, in the wider world. I've got the park opposite. There are very few annuals. Annuals don't, there are some wildflowers, but annuals don't actually, it's not the natural things that grow here. What grow here is trees and perennial herbs of various kinds. And uh, Charlotte, who was running, organizing the talk, asked me to bring a little something to show. So this is what I've got from my garden today. This is the perennial uh, flower from my garden. So you can still have flowers, um, but move to things like bulbs uh, and particularly, I suggest, fruit of various kinds. Um, 
annuals have a set growing cycle, particularly annual vegetables, have a set growing cycle through the year, and that's very easily disrupted by any of those freaky weather events uh, that I've mentioned already. Um, much better to have perennials, which can cope much better with extremes of cold, wet, uh, heat, and will just adjust their growing cycle through the year. Trees, bulbs, uh, perennial herbs um, will just adjust their growing cycle to the weather. Um, third point, polyculture, not monoculture. Um, a monoculture is where you have big beds or even fields full of crops uh, that are all the same. So a huge field of potatoes or carrots or even a bed of those things. Um, growing monoculture means that you're very exposed to any problem with that crop. So if, if carrots fail and you're mostly growing carrots in a big bed, then you're not going to have any carrots. By growing a polyculture, in other words, lots of things together, you pretty much guarantee that if one's having a bad year, another one will be having a good year. So in case of our tree fruit, plums might do very badly, but you've got apples doing really well that year. So particularly growing native, uh, um, having a native polyculture, lots of native plants, um, almost, I mean, if your garden is literally underwater or hit by a hurricane, not much is going to survive, but almost uh, any weather, some plants will thrive and do well uh, in that weather. Um, however dry, wet, hot, cold, windy it is, there's something, if you've got a good monoculture, most, a good polyculture, mostly of native perennials, you'll get some yield out of your garden, be it apples, plums, strawberries, raspberries. I mean, in my opinion and my experience, raspberries just survive anything. You know, it doesn't matter what the weather does, they will always fruit. Uh, you'll always have something. Um, unlike particularly leaf, leafy annuals, which just, you have a week of dryness and they all just die. Um, so that's my adaptation point. Get ready for climate weirding, plant perennials, move to polycultures. In other words, lots of different types of plants. Then we move on to mitigation. Uh, how can your garden be used to reduce uh, your carbon footprint? This is actually very straightforward. Um, plant trees is the number one thing to do. 50% of wood is carbon, which is absorbed from the atmosphere. So whether you've got small trees or big trees, whether you've got little woody uh, gooseberry bushes or a massive big oak tree, 50% of the wood, I think it's actually 49%, but, but basically half of the volume of that wood is carbon that's taken out of the atmosphere. They also produce a microclimate, uh, leafy uh, trees, um, which will cool your garden. Um, evidence in Barcelona, planting street trees shows that they can reduce the ambient temperature by two degrees on the hottest day, which is quite considerable. And that doesn't include shading, of course. They also have very positive shading effects for when it's very hot. They'll also hold water uh, in the ground. So uh, lots of benefits there. So plant, plant trees, and woody plants. Um, the next thing, soil as a carbon sink. Um, the amount of carbon in the soil can range about sevenfold from the most carbon rich soil to a very poor carbon soil. So soil throughout the world is a crucial way of, of storing carbon. Primarily that's in things like peat soil, but garden soil also can hold a huge amount of carbon. How do we make sure the carbon stays in the soil? Um, don't dig it. And uh, if you look online, you can find good tips about no dig. Obviously, if you're following my advice of perennial polyculture, it'll be largely no dig anyway. Keep it covered because rainfall falling on the soil washes out the carbon. So low laying, low, low growing perennial uh, shrubs uh, or bushes or just leafy herbs. Keep the soil covered as much as possible um, and add manure, uh, organic matter, mulch, whatever. The more carbon rich stuff you can stick on top of your soil, uh, the richer it will, it will be. So trees, plant trees, soil is a carbon sink. And then the third point, reduce use of chemicals uh, in your garden. Um, I suppose in theory, poly, uh, permaculture is pretty much organic. I know we're gonna hear about that from our Indian friends in a minute, um, but uh, you know, you don't have to be fully organic. But as far as possible, reduce pesticides and artificial fertilizers. Artificial fertilizers in particular are a problem because they have a high carbon impact through their production and they can also leach uh, if they're not used properly. So that's my third point. Um, so we've got plant trees, build soil as a carbon sink, reduce chemical use in your garden.
And then my final three points, uh, thinking differently. Um, the first one is go for a local diet. I've already touched on that. What grows naturally where you are? And although in Europe we're very, or in Britain, we're very dependent on a wheat-based diet, actually wheat isn't a native here, and it's a heck of a job to get it to grow. If you try and grow wheat in your garden, it's a heck of a struggle. Um, you're much better to grow uh, fruit, lots of fruit. There's all kinds of fruit grow here. Um, and uh, perennial salads and herbs. So increase the amount, I'm not saying give up on annual vegetables. In fact, my advice would be, I mean, if you want to grow annual vegetables in your garden, who am I to stop you? Go for it. But what I would suggest actually is you subscribe to a veg box scheme from a lovely uh, local community supported agriculture scheme to get your uh, annual veg, your potatoes, your carrots and so on. Um, and what you grow in your own garden is fruit, salad and herbs. And that makes economic sense as well. So that's my second point. Think about the value you get from your garden. Potatoes, even organic, beautifully locally grown potatoes are cheap as chips, literally, hence the phrase cheap as chips. Um, fruit, particularly things like blackberries, raspberries, I mean, you easily pay two or three pounds a punnet. You just compare the weight. How many potatoes can you get for two or three pounds to how many raspberries you can get? And that's because they're soft and squishy, they're hard to transport, they mold quickly, they don't have a long shelf life. And that's true of salad and herbs as well. So if you just walk around your supermarket and look at the price of things, I think that can be a very good guide to what you should be growing in your garden. Um, they tend also to be very overpackaged as well. So, so, so raspberries, blackberries, plums, uh, all kinds of herbs, salad, fresh salad, they're all the most expensive things in the supermarket. And if you put them in the fridge, they're also the things you're most likely to waste. So that's part of reducing food, food waste. You know, raspberries will go off after four or five days. How many of us find that moldy lettuce at the back of the fridge? Uh, much better to have those leaves alive in your, in your garden. Um, so, and then my, my ninth and final point, think about multiple yields from your garden. I did a similar talk to this, a much longer talk uh, at the end of last year, and identified about 20 different yields you could get from your garden. That includes things like sunbathing, uh, a pond, you know, so you can go through and list all the many yields that you want. And when you're designing your garden, I would start with that list. Write down all the things you want to get. Do you want a space for sun bathing? Do you want a space where the kids can play football? Do you want a sand pit? Do you want a pond? But I'm going to just say there are three yields which are mutually supportive. And we're generally taught that these things aren't supportive. And I think that's completely wrong. Permaculture would say these things all enhance each other, which is biodiversity, food and pleasure. Um, I, you know, we tend to think about uh, a farm, it's either highly productive or it's highly friendly to nature. Well, I would dispute that. I would say the three basic yields for your garden ought to be, am I ensuring biodiversity? Am I getting some decent food that I'm going to enjoy eating? And is this garden giving me pleasure? And if it's not doing one of those three, I would go and do something else, frankly. <laughs> if you don't enjoy your gardening, you know, go and, I don't know, go skateboarding or whatever it is, that go for a bike ride. So uh, I think my time is nearly up. Um, I'll just very quickly recap and then I'll deal with a few questions that were sent in advance. I've suggested that climate change has three pillars, adaptation, mitigation, and thinking differently. And for the climate change garden, each of those can be applied in three ways. For adaptation, think about climate weirding and the impact on your garden. Plant perennials, plant polyculture. For mitigation, plant trees and woody plants, build soil as a carbon sink, reduce the use of chemicals. And for thinking differently, focus on a local diet, think about the value that you're getting from your garden, what are the high value things that you can grow um, and, and, and enjoy multiple yields, particularly biodiversity, food and pleasure. Each of those could be developed in a small way. Um, I hope that's all right for everyone. I've gone at a cracking pace through that. Um, I was sent some questions in advance. Um, Rachel, could you just hold up some fingers for how many minutes I've got left? Two minutes, fine, okay. Um, so I had some lovely questions, some of which I hope, we've, hope I've dealt with uh, already. Um, Liz asks, I love cooking and gardening and have four raised beds in a south facing garden. What should I plant to ensure maximum yield and sustainable cooking? I mean, my view would be, I used to grow lots of annual vegetables. I've changed it all to soft fruit production. My view would be, personally, if it was me, I'd be planting gooseberries, red, black, white currants, strawberries, raspberries, maybe something more exotic like a kiwi, 
um, in, in the raised beds. And I find those things absolutely love being in the raised beds. I would stick in some herbs uh, as well, because having a handful of herbs, I mean, even if you've got boring old potatoes that you've got in your veg bag, having a handful of herbs, you know, cooking them with some chives or uh, whatever can just lift, lift them. So that would be my advice. Francis asks where to start. Um, well, I hope I've given some ideas. I mean, I would say the most basic and productive thing, it sounds ridiculous because it's a weed in most places, but is to put a blackberry uh, bush in. Uh, some raspberries, uh, a tree. Uh, someone asks, Zoe asks how to do it on a budget. Um, obviously, ideally, if you're rich, go to, or well off, go to a garden centre, get advice on the best local variety uh, for you and buy that. That For an apple tree, that might be about 30 quid. Um, and I would recommend doing that. But if you're on a tight budget, pop into Aldi or Lidl or Morrison's exactly now at this time of year, you can pick up a decent fruit tree. That pear tree that was in the video of my garden, we got that for about eight quid. You can get a decent apple tree for five quid, raspberry bushes, blackberry bushes for two or three uh, quid. So that uh, would be my advice. Can you do it with not a lot of room? Absolutely. Um, a small tree, make sure it's on a dwarfing rootstock, uh, raspberries, blackberries, a couple of fruit bushes, underplanted with you know, chives, parsley, thyme, rosemary, um, that, that'll fit even in a small space. Uh, the one exception I might make would be tomatoes. I think they're worth growing in the garden because they're so much better than, uh, than, than shop-bought ones. Best things to grow on a windowsill, I mean, I would say peppers. If you grow peppers on a windowsill, uh, they will produce, if it's warm, they'll produce fruit continually all year. You can grow spicy ones, uh, which are great, or you can grow, um, you know, a big like capsicum type big ones to, to cook. Watch out for green fly, but they'll produce right through the year. You can even be eating peppers at, at Christmas if you've got your central heating on and if it's south facing window. And the last question, David asks, every seed or plant says I should use compost. How do I do that sustainably with just one compost bin? Um, well, I think it's fine to buy compost, David. Uh, don't buy peat-based compost. I've already mentioned the importance of peat as a carbon sink. Avoid any peat-based garden products. They're terrible for climate change. Um, but you can get sustainable compost probably from your council, from a sustainable garden centre. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be compost you've made. Uh, yourself and there is some confusion actually with the word compost because when we talk about making compost in a bin that isn't actually the same stuff you get as planting compost uh, for some reason in the past those words have got confused so if you're planting seeds by planting compost just make sure it's from a, a sustainable source i would start with your local council website uh, honestly um so thank you for those questions really good there'll be a chance to ask more later thanks for listening I hope I've got my key points across and I hope I've inspired you all to rush out into your garden this afternoon and start planting. Now is the perfect time to get out there and start planting those fruit trees, fruit bushes and herbs. The next month is peak planting time. For those things. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Chris, for a brilliant session on adaptation, mitigation and thinking differently. I've got a whole bunch of notes from what you've just shared. And it's amazing to think what we can do from our own gardens to make a difference in the climate crisis. So we'll soon be moving to the debate. And before that, we'll actually watch a clip from some of our growers, tea growers in India. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about this global problem. We all have a part to play in the solution. And this is a really exciting time. We've just seen what we can collectively do when we work together. We've seen millions of people come together as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen millions of people take a stand when it comes to climate change. And Chris has just shown us a few of the ways we can make a difference. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about that. I think it's really important to think about how these problems affect each and every one of us. So I don't know about you guys, but I love chocolate. And as you can probably tell from the map behind me, my family are from Ghana in West Africa. West Africa actually produces around 50% of the world's cocoa, the key ingredient in chocolate. And sadly, with climate change, West Africa is becoming too hot to actually produce cocoa. So think about what that will do for you when you want to get your favorite snack in 10 or 20 years time. Similarly, when it comes to coffee, 50% of the land that we use to grow coffee will just be lost because of the climate crisis. And we can't allow this situation to continue. 
but you can help. You can contribute to biodiversity at home. Uh, you can grow your own food and you can enjoy gardening, doing some of the things that Chris just talked about. Uh, you can particularly reduce your carbon footprint by growing soft fruits, herbs and salads, which is really exciting. And another really important thing that you can do is buy fair trade. So as I mentioned before, there are more and more items than now than ever that are fair trade. Uh, I mentioned that I'm wearing a fair trade outfit down to the jewellery and you can buy fair trade clothing from brands like People Tree. You can buy fair trade tea, coffee, you can buy fair trade bananas, you can get fair trade pretty much everything. So I would implore you when you are out doing your grocery shop or if you're ordering online, look for the fair trade logo. And if you're in a position to do so, please support us by going to our website. Uh, so fairtrade.org.uk forward slash festival and make a donation to the work that we're doing all around the world to create a better world for everyone. So for your children, for the next generation, but also for you, this crisis is moving faster than any of us could have anticipated. And it's incredible to know that we can make a difference. So before I go back to our incredible panel, who we will be hearing more from, we're going to have a short video from some of our tea growers in South India. I am Titus Gerard Pinto. I am a director of United England Tea Estates. We are based in uh, South India, in the mountains region of Nilgiris. I have been in this company for the last 40 years. I joined in the early 80s and I have seen the change in climate over a period of time. I am Pritam. Uh, I am also the Fair Trade Officer of United Nilgiri Tea Estate Company Limited. We were one of the first fair trade uh, registered companies in South India. We, we were the uh, pioneers in uh, implementing fair trade projects in South India. Of late, in the recent years, the weather pattern has really changed and we are unable to carry out the works how we used to carry out, say, five years ago. When I had joined the company, we could predict weather. There were definite periods when you would have monsoon, you have winter and the summer showers. So it's very easy for us to operate. Rainfall was moderate, but very well spread. Today, we have unpredictable weather, unseasonal rainfall, and a huge variation in temperatures. So especially because we're an agriculture-based industry, it is very, very difficult to forecast. We had certain regular works like weed set being done only in summer, uh, manuring done only in monsoon. So you, it was easy for us for our operations. Today we are not able to do that. Tea grows well when the weather is, or the maximum minimum is recorded within a uh, uh, difference of 10 degrees. Whereas as of now, uh, we do uh, observe the maximum and minimum temperatures varying up to 20 degrees Celsius. So this is affecting the growth of tea and affecting the uh, quality as well as quantity of tea produced in the Nilgiris. We were probably the second garden in South India to go organic. And we have scaled it up, which most companies have not done. And the fair trade premium has helped us have a sustainable organic cultivation. Going organic is the best option uh, to mitigate this organic, uh, the climate change. By going organic, we leave it to the nature to play its own role and the predators to control the pests and disease. So that's the option which we are following. Now, advantage is what we have noticed, especially with Clipper buying a lot of organic teas. There has been a total connect between nature, flora, fauna and people. Now, if this chain is broken, it disrupts the whole uh, atmosphere and the consequences is for all. So what have we done? Out of 1,400 hectares of land which we have, only 800 and odd hectares is tea. We have natural forest which we preserve and we have got about 500-600 acres which is under renewable forest. So there is a balance. It will take time. We have done it for the last 25 years but I feel that we should do it much longer to develop an ideal balance. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to hear a bit more about the connection between nature, flora, fauna and people. 
And now we're heading into our panel discussion. Remember, there will be an opportunity to answer your questions. So just type them into the live chat and we will come to those. So I'm going to introduce our panel now for those who are just joining. We have the Fairtrade Tea Growers, Preetham and Mr. Pinto from the Fairtrade Chamraj Tea Estate in South India, who we just heard from in the video. Thank you for joining us. We have Eco Chef Tom Hunt, who has just released a new book called Eating for Pleasure, People and Planet. And you'll be pleased to know that you have a chance to win a copy of this book. Just head to the Fairtrade UK Instagram page or Twitter page and you can enter the competition. If you're really into it, you can enter in both places to maximise your chances. And last but not least, we have Chris Warburton Brown, a climate action coordinator from the Permaculture Association, who we just had that incredible workshop from. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we go to audience questions, I have a few questions. So my first is almost on behalf of the audience. So people are joining us today because they want to live sustainably, they want to make a change, and they want to tackle the climate crisis. So if there's just one thing that they should be thinking about, what do you think that would be? And we can go with anyone. Chris, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I, I think that's very difficult to answer because it depends on your lifestyle. But very, very quickly, I've always thought there are four key things you can do, which is insulate your house, fly less or don't fly at all, uh, eat less meat. Uh, and of course, I've forgotten the fourth one because you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> but never mind, there's <laughs> three, three things. Oh, and I think about, uh, yeah, yeah, commuting. If you if it, change your commuting uh, to make it more uh, sustainable. They're probably the four areas that most people are, are, are having the highest impact. So insulate, don't fly, think about your commute, uh, eat less meat. Thanks, Chris. And Tom, if you had to pick just one action that people could take to make a difference, what would you select? Hi. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say it's a real privilege to be here on this panel with all of you and connecting with farmers around the world, too. I mean, that's incredible. It's so important that we hear from them because they're on the front line of all the change that's happening. And it's hard to kind of understand it fully without speaking and hearing from them. Um, but I mean, food, for, you know, I'm a chef, so food is my world, but it also is everyone's world and it produces a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. It's arguably the biggest, has the biggest impact on the environment. And so I believe that we can, it's also something that we can address ourselves very easily. So, I think the key thing to do is to support better farming. Um, but, and we can do that, or we can create a budget for doing that through reducing our waste, eating more plants, and connecting with our farmers through certifications such as fair trade, but also shortening the food, train, um, food, food chain. So really it's about transparency and understanding where our food comes from so that we can support those farmers <laughs> and essentially uh, good soil health and biodiversity. Thanks, Tom, brilliant answer. And Preetham, what's one way that we can live more sustainably in the UK? Sustainability is very important uh, today because for example, I'm talking more about the tea, which has been like last hundred years or plus, we have been exploiting the soil. So definitely the soil is really exploited and we have to reconvert the soil to a good health with good humors. So that's what we do. We do. We don't buy inputs from outside. We make our own composting. All the molecules like trichoderma, azospirillum, phosphobacter, whatever is required, we do in-house. And the whole idea is to get the soil back to shape what the soil was 100 years ago. So I would suggest everybody should stop exploiting the soil. Just live it to the best and cultivate what best you could do. So over exploitation is what is happening all around, and that is what the reason, one of the reasons for climate change, I would say. Thank you. Very important point. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Pinto, anything to add? How can we live more sustainably in the UK? Uh, Mr. Pinto, you're on mute right now. Muted. 
So it looked like you were given a very okay. impassioned yeah. point. Yes. Um, see, while we accept climate change, the solutions for climate change have to be sustainable, especially from a farmer's viewpoint. That will make me continue with the solution. And um, like Chris said, we have a balance between native forests and uh, tea cultivation. We cannot do without both. And that has to be sustained. And the most important, I feel, is educating the school children. And then you will have a solution for the future. And we run a school through fated premiums for about 1,200 children who come from 26 villages. Now, these are the people who are motivated and who will come and implement solutions. That is something I think all of us have to do. And we have a platform like Fatrade, where we went organic, we were able to sell organic teas. That is where we're sustainable and we scale it up. And the more you support Fatrade, more you support uh, organic initiatives, the world is going to be a much pleasanter place to live. Thank you, Mr. Pinto. Excellent point. Education is crucial in the battle against the climate crisis. Uh, on to my next question. So I'm curious to know what are the most concerning aspects of climate change that you've personally witnessed or that you are concerned about? And Tom, I know that you've done a lot of great work with the Fair Trade Foundation and you visited places like Palestine and Kenya. So I'd be really keen to hear what aspects of climate change have you seen in those regions? Yeah, I mean, it was a real privilege to go and see fair trades projects firsthand in those countries and to understand what an incredible impact they're having and how it is so empowering for the people there. I mean, it's really about <clears throat> the farmers and cooperatives in those regions taking back control. And um, really that is all about now, this discussion of climate change and climate resilience, because how can a farmer be sustainable if they're not making enough money to cultivate their crops and they're having to over exploit them with chemicals and things like this. So, yeah, I mean, a specific example that comes to mind is Kenya. Uh, we went to the Kebingtuni Coffee Cooperative just west of the Rift Valley, where we visited a project called Growing Women in Coffee. And there it, um, we, we met a lot of different women who had been given ownership of their coffee bushes for the first time in history. Until then, um, it was, yeah, kind of patriarchy really. And, or, um, and so what happened through giving that ownership to these women is that they started to improve the health of those coffee bushes. They tripled the production of their coffee. And of course, a healthy coffee bush is a climate resilient coffee bush. It's gonna be able to withstand the whims of nature as it changes. Um, but alongside that project, they spoke to the people in the villages there and they said one of the key issues that they had was although they're doing 70% of the labor, the women, they're still having to cook the food for the family, dress the children and collect all of the firewood. And they're collecting firewood from protected woodland that should be left there to continue sequestrating carbon. They're actually having to pull those trees down and things like that. So what Fair Trade Africa and the cooperative did there is they installed bio slurry um, biogas plants at each house simply by putting in a um, very simple facility between the cow shed and the house to store the bio slurry and produce gas. So in before that, they were burning this firewood in the house, creating loads of smoke. And, and so, of course, burning that wood is releasing the carbon back into the atmosphere. Um, oh, Siri's talking in the background, that's weird. Um, and so it really shows the, the massive impact that, that that sort of initiative has environmentally, reducing kind of, yeah, the use of these trees and cleaning the air in the houses and things like that. Um, in Palestine, very quickly, I mean, obviously there's very, there's strong political issues there, but there's also kind of issues of, and therefore issues of access to water. And then there's also drought um, problems. So it was interesting to see how their people are adapting and, and using 
drought resistant almond trees and things like this and, and coping still with the support of fair trade. Thanks, it's incredible to hear all of the just innovative ways that people are tackling this across the world. So same question to Pritham and Mr Pinto, but in the interest of time, we'll hear from one of you on your first-hand experiences so that we have time for audience questions too. Now, one of the positive impacts of going organic, you straight away see that the health of the worker changes. He doesn't fall sick because all the water you get are from natural streams and you don't need to treat it. Now, earlier, he used to be absent 25% of the working days. Today, he works full time, all working days, and he is able to earn more. When he earns more, there's always a positive impact to his family, his children, his children are better looked after, and he can afford a lot many things than before. That is one positive impact of uh, going on. Second is nature has got a tremendous capacity to heal as long as you don't destroy it. You find native grasses growing in a particular place, don't bring in uh, non-native species, either grass or trees. When you bring in native species, they, like Chris said, they do have a positive impact. Perennials is a great solution, but you still need vegetables. Grow them in smaller patches and plant vegetables of the season, not of the season, because you have bees, you have um, uh, lots of birds, which also depend on these uh, flowers and crops. So they, when you have flowers in the flowering season locally, the bees population increases. So these yeah. are the positive impacts. Yeah. That's so right. that's why I tell people, educate our children and you'll have large scale solutions. Thank you, Mr. Pinto. One final question before we move on to audience questions. If we were having this conversation in 10 years time, what would you like to be different? And I'll go first to Pritham and then to Chris for that question. So Pritham, what would you like to be different in 10 years time? When it comes to- In 10 to years time, because in our case, because a lot of villages are dependent on our operations. So I would see the whole district out of chemicals and all lead a healthy life, eat good food, and basically not dependent on chemicals. I hope fair trade keeps supporting us so that 26 villages which are dependent on our operations will also benefit. So hopefully we'll see a far better change in the living conditions, not only the people working in the estate, as well as the surrounding people. Excellent, thank you. Um, we'll hear briefly from Tom and then from Chris. So Tom, what would you want to be different in 10 years time when it comes to the conversation around climate change? Well, controversial as it might sound, it'd be great if fair trade didn't need to exist anymore because I mean, it's in a way it's crazy that it does. Um, and if we can create a fair food system, it's going to be a climate resilient one where everyone eats good, flavorful, pleasurable, nourishing food. Certainly with you on that, Tom. And Chris, what would you like to be different in 10 years time? Um, well, I, I'm not getting paid to sponsor uh, by, by the, being sponsored by the BBC, but I would highly recommend there was an edition of the food program, which you can pick up on uh, BBC Sounds, which dealt exactly with this question. It was a mock documentary made in 2030, uh, looking back at the changes that had happened. Um, so, I mean, I, that's a half hour long program. I can't repeat everything from it. It's a really good program. Um, and it shows how radical the shift in food culture needs to be. I mean, there's so many absolutely radical uh, changes in that. So uh, my simple answer would be that where our food comes from, how it's grown, how our urban and countryside areas uh, look would be radically transformed to support uh, local, sustainable, climate friendly growing. And that means a big shift in diet and everyone joining in and supporting that, getting behind that. Um, so, yeah, I would totally recommend that program. I think it was October, November last year. You'll find it on BBC okay. Sounds and it's really a manifesto for how we could transform our food system in the UK for human health and for planetary health. Amazing. It's so important to think of people and planet when we're considering our responses. So excellent answer there, Chris. Right. We're going into some of the audience questions. 
So Kathy Keeley has asked, uh, particularly for Pritham and Pinto, uh, what do you think about agroforestry? So growing crops between trees. What are your thoughts on that? We are growing crops between trees. We have lots of trees in the tea garden. And Excellent. that is a necessity, but is also important. And I strongly feel there has to be a, ma a match between a tree cover and growing crops underneath. And uh, mixed crop, mixed cross farming, it is growing a lot in India now. People don't go for money, uh, monoculture. People are growing for mixed crops. We are now trying to use oranges in our tea gardens, grow fruit crops in our tea gardens. And this is a agroforestry is for the future because trees also contribute a lot to uh, absorb carbon and especially shade and reduce temperature impact. Thank you. And Chris, do you have any thoughts on agroforestry before we move on to the next question? Um, well, I'm, a big thing in permaculture is forest gardening, which is agroforestry on a small scale. And I think most of what I said in my talk, you know, moving towards woody yeah. perennial uh, polycultures, exactly as Mr. Pinto said, I, I can't add much more except to say, I think that is the future of, of food growing on a small and large scale is, is trees and crops growing side by side. Definitely, very important point. Okay, we have a bit of a controversial question from Eleanor Kunor. Um, this is for everyone, but we'll start with Tom. And the question is, what do you say to the naysayers about climate change? So we've all seen the conspiracy theorists who are very, I would say, active on social media that claim that, uh, you know, the climate crisis isn't real. So what would your response to those people be? And we'll start with Tom. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, thankfully they're few and far between now. There's mostly a consensus, isn't there, across the world that it exists. And even that we can have an impact as individuals, which is, I, I think is a huge shift. Um, but for those people who don't feel like they are important in this kind of, as in this big, ecosystem that we're all connected to I think it's just really important to invite them to well look at the science um, but also to take pleasure in their food and maybe come at them from a slightly different angle of like enjoying new ingredients and therefore supporting biodiversity and maybe making it more about less about kind of finger wagging and more about um, promoting the solutions. Brilliant. And Preetham, what are your thoughts on that? What do you say to people that claim climate change isn't real? When it's, everybody is watching every day, it's there on the news, it's there on the paper. If people are not aware of it, I don't know, even if they're so ignorant, I don't know how we can go and help them. But this is happening everywhere, every doorstep, it's happening. So, I mean, that's what I would say, because ignorance definitely will not, it's not the answer. People have to react for this. Yeah, I love what Mr. Pinto said earlier about education. It's such a crucial part of the battle against the climate crisis. So final pre-submitted question from the audience before we go on to final statements from everyone on the panel. Uh, so actually we have two. So Victoria asked Preetham, how can I improve my home wormery to make it better? Uh, by better, she means finer. So to make better compost that all my plants will thrive on. To be honest, making wormy compost is no rocket science. You have to just replicate what is happening under a tree in a forest. So it's like your carbonaceous material, your nitrogenous material, little bit of cow dung, slurry, water, and worms. So it's there is a lot of uh, uh, YouTube videos available. You can follow any of this. Don't buy anything from outside. You can use your kitchen waste, your garden waste. So it's as simple as that. Give a good food to the worms. They'll churn it out to a good wormy compost. Brilliant, I like that. Okay, so fair trade shoppers in the UK have been asked to choose the world you want. And one of the questions from our audience is, if you could choose the world you wanted to see, what would it look like? And if everyone could answer briefly, that would be great. So we'll start with Tom. What would your ideal world look like? Well, I mean, a, f a kind of equal world, um, I, I believe, I mean, I've been aware and supported fair trade all of my life because I was just 
really couldn't understand why it needed to exist, why governments weren't supporting the people that produce our food. And so I think we need to create a uh, really uh, equal world through supporting those people properly. Um, and it's just such a pleasure to kind of contribute and help fair trade do that. Thank you, Tom. And Prefam, on the same question, what would your ideal world look like? Uh, happy old, healthy old, definitely not with Corona and other kind of stuff. All cheerful people all around with good health, good spirits. And definitely with fair trade support, I think everybody should benefit. And I would request all the listeners to support fair trade movement, buy fair trade stuff, and everybody benefits for a I good cause. That. Brilliant. And Chris, what's your ideal world? Um, well, Tom said about being positive, getting people to be positive about food and thinking about it that way. And, and we built 52 Climate Actions absolutely with the idea of being positive about that. So every one of those actions isn't just a benefit for the climate, it's benefits humans. It, what Pritham just said, human happiness, human fulfillment, human spirits, human health. So I would say, I mean, there are 52 different answers to that that are on our website. Uh, every single one of them, it would improve people's quality of life. And I think seeing the climate crisis it is a crisis, but it's also a massive opportunity to deal with things that Tom said about fairness, equality, treating each other better, raising our spirits, being happy. People are, it's a real danger of people falling into climate grief and climate despair, and that's something we have to go through. But then coming out the other side and embracing this time of change as a time to really build a positive future. So many great things that would be terrible things we've been struggling with for so long can be transformed by positive answers to the climate crisis. So I would say my vision for the future world is where many of those solutions are implemented and every day everybody's enjoying the benefits of those solutions to climate change that we have. Excellent. Finally, Mr. Pinto. We are a rural industry and I get a lot of visitors from the city. And there's one thing I do with all of them, take them for a walk to the native forest and the nature speaks to them. Uh, much quieter than outside, temperatures are lower, birds speak to them, and there's total silence. It is a positive effect. I don't need to speak to those people at all. Nature has educated them. It couldn't be better because walking through a native forest is probably the best education people can have. There are ground plants, there are mid-elevation plants, there are creepers, there's a top tree cover, lots of birds, and if you're lucky, you can also see animals. There's a perfect harmony. Nature educates in the best possible way. Brilliant. Thank you for those answers. I've been so inspired by this panel. So thank you, Preetham. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Pinto. Thank you, Chris. I, I'm going to give my answer as well. So if I thought of the world I would love to see, it would be one where people live in perfect harmony with the planet, where we don't have to have conversations about things like inequality and injustice, because we're so committed to making sure that we're living sustainably that there, there's no time to be unjust and unfair. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to invite everyone, if you can do so, please make a donation. Uh, you can do that on fairtrade.org. Uh, today is, as I mentioned, Ghanaian Independence Day. It's also the UK Black Pound Day, and it's a great opportunity to support fair trade businesses that are owned by black British people too. Uh, the most important thing you can do to make a change is make that decision to live sustainably. Think about buying fair trade, think about what you can do in your own garden and think about how you can spread the word either individually by yourself or by making a donation to the work of fairtrade.org so that we can collectively get that message out there and make sure that workers and farmers and producers and growers across the world are paid properly so that they can actually afford to take a stand when it comes to the climate crisis so we can have a better world for ourselves for our children and for future generations thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you next time bye guys choose fair trade you choose the world you want to today by fair trade, giving power to farmers. Fair trade premium, making a difference in their lives. Maybe.
maybe we can choose to fight and start a fight. Choose to fight against COVID-19. Join the fight against climate change. Support the fight against child labor. You choose the world you want Today you make the change you want Tomorrow you choose the world you want If you choose fair trade You choose the world you want A better deal for farmers. Choose the power to save the world every day. The choices you make can change the world you ever wanted. If you choose fair trade, you choose the world you want. Choose the world you